Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Tunnel Vision. I'm your host, Ryan Abraham, publisher of uscfootball.com, joined alongside in studio by Connor Morissette, Mr. Triple Double himself, and Chris and Trevino. They're both coming right from campus where they got to hear from the new USC defensive coaching staff, plus head coach Lincoln Riley. So we wanted to do a show kind of breaking it all down. We did a little earlier today than we normally do, like our Thursday kind of show, because they have a basketball game tonight. Um, so we wanted to kind of get this one out of the way. But fresh uh, from campus, we wanted to get the thoughts of Chris and Connor, who were there to hear uh, from all of the uh, new defensive coaches. Uh, welcome, guys. How are you guys doing? Doing well, Chris. How are you? How was the drive? Difficult. Not difficult. Obviously, there was uh, traffic, but I literally just walked in here like – two minutes ago so just trying to uh get my bearings a little bit so i haven't done a show with you two it's been a while it's yeah, been a this, minute this feels like the season uh i, I want to know why is this not a parasol podcast i don't know we haven't done a like a tunnel vision show so we're like it's kind of like gonna be like an evening one so we're doing like tunnel vision but it'll have some crossover stuff uh but yeah so this is our video show if you're listening you can still we're gonna put it up as a podcast as well so if you're listening uh Thank you for doing that wherever you listen to the podcast. And uh, yeah, and if you're watching on YouTube, please uh, like the, uh, the the video. Hit that little thumbs up button there. You can subscribe. Uh, get the notifications with a little bell there so you know when we go live. Um, we appreciate that and all the uh, patronage from everyone out there. We wanted to get all the thoughts of what's been going on. Yeah, we haven't done one. I think maybe it was after the Holiday Bowl. It's been a while since we've done like a tunnel vision. I yeah, and, you, and you had COVID too, right? So that was yeah, that I couldn't even go to that. And I didn't go today to the press conference. They had uh, there was limitations apparently. Uh, only two people from every uh, media outlet. So I let Chris and Connor go. So I'm I'm you know I want to hear what they have to say about this too because they were there, get to see, hear in person, maybe reach out and touch them. Maybe they, they were that close to see what was going on with the uh, with the new staff. So we appreciate that. We want to get in. Uh, and getting all their thoughts about that. How are you guys doing okay? Everything everything good? It's been a long morning of listening and taking in and uploading video. So yeah, but I'm here to I'm here to talk. I love it. Uh well that's that's why we're here. We're to talk, look pretty or not so pretty, uh, on video. If you are in the chat and you have a question, we're not gonna do any live calls for this one, but uh, if you're in the chat and have a question, just put like question uh, in the YouTube chat. If we're all, we should be live on Facebook and Twitter as well. We, I see a Facebook comment in there. Um, so uh, if you have, if you're watching on Facebook, put your comments in there. If you're watching on YouTube, put your comments. And if you have a question, uh, put question. I will start and we'll get back to it later and try to answer all those later on. I do want to thank uh, our sponsor, Trader Joe's. They've been uh, great to us over the years. It's been a lot of fun. Kind of working with them, you know, day after Valentine's Day, it's a little bit different. If if you want to get, you know, flowers for Valentine's Day, it's kind of like the thing. People do that. Uh, if you hit live here in L.A., people go downtown to that flower mart. That's kind of cool. They do a lot of stuff. But if you want the daily flower, like just because whoever your significant other is or someone you just want to brighten their day, they have an amazing arrangement, uh, a set, you know, a variety of arrangements of flowers at your Trader Joe's store. So just go in there. I mean, 10 bucks, you can get something really cool, pop it in, uh, get some chocolate covered uh, pretzels or something and uh, bring it over to, and you're going to brighten somebody's day. So I love the, if you want to just pick up some flowers over there, you're going over to someone's dinner party, something they could put on their table. I know just flowers are on everyone's mind because it's Valentine's day, but Trader Joe's all year round has great uh, a selection of different flowers. I don't know if you guys have got flowers for people before from Trader Joe's, but it works well, trust me. Yeah, I, I've done it, and it's cheap. It's not going to break, uh, break the bank, excuse me, like uh, some other places. So uh, awesome suggestion, and I love getting my flowers there. Yeah. Chris, did you uh, – have you gone there for them? Or? I'm going to be straight up honest. I don't, but every time I go to Trader Jones with my partner, she always beeline to the flowers because they're right there when you walk in. She always takes a gander at the flowers. And she has bought flowers for, was... for people in her life, but I – I've never been a, a Trader Joe's flower person, but maybe I will be next year because I Chris, buy flowers. I, I mean, I'm not the most observant person in the world, but if every time you walk in with your girlfriend and she beelines for the flowers, 
you know what you should do, dummy, next time you go without her? Buy her one of the flowers. Like, it doesn't seem like that hard. She prefers the food to a flower. Okay. Um, but if she always goes to the flowers, maybe get her some. We're, we're, I, I see what you're saying. You're right. But uh, it doesn't matter. She's not real anyway, so who cares? <laughs> <laughs> but thank you to Trader Joe's and their lovely arrangement of flowers. Um, very, th yeah, thank you to Trader Joe's for that. They are cool. Tip says, welcome back uh, to Chris. So uh, that's good. And Mark says, hello to uh, Ryan, Triple Double, and Chrissy T. And uh, we have, I should uh, pull this up here. I got to. Um, breaking news. He's going to break news. I got I to break. Well, it's not breaking news, but uh, this is great. Um, yeah, we have a. Uh, oh. From Blackie Chan. I saw him. He was on the uh, the official USC official uh, feed. He was in there. So um, fight on. That's the, it. Yeah, the press conference got me pumped. Using that energy at the gym. These coaches are future head coaches. Eric Henderson makes me want to run through brick walls for him. Uh, hashtag dog work. Um, we have a. Guy was a head coach not that long ago, and he's uh, he's uh, one of the assistant coaches. So, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think when Lincoln Riley had his opening, it's maybe it's a, thank you for the super chat by the way, Blackie Chan. I really appreciate that. He said that they you know they narrowed that list down. And they had like seven like amazing candidates, and they like got four of them. So uh, it seemed like they got the guys that they were really looking for, and you know he didn't mince any words saying that they he thought they had the best defensive staff or best coaching staff in football, not just college football, NFL too. Uh, it's debatable, but uh, he seems very happy uh, with the staff, I guess you could say. As he should be. I mean, Eric Henderson, I think, is a guy who's a great motivator and just Blackie Chan mentioned how he wants to run through a brick wall for him. I mean, that's how I left that meeting today, Chris. Really, really excited about him and just what he's going to do in the recruiting space and also as a coach. And it just seems like they've made some big upgrades and we can get into everything that they had to say. Overall, though, I think you got to feel good if you're a USC fan today. Of course, a lot has to still go right, and it's still so early. This group, of course, will face adversity, but I think it's pretty obvious to say the defensive staff has been upgraded, and I don't even think that's debatable. There will be better results on the field because these guys are just better at their jobs. I, I think that's obvious right now. Right, and I don't want to be the one to like throw water on everything. Because it is just a press conference. It's easy to win a press conference. It's hard to lose a press conference. And they won the press conference. Lincoln Riley and all the guys that spoke today on Thursday. But yeah, they said a lot of exciting things. They said a lot of things that got fans fired up and ready to run through walls. And you know, there was a lot of things that they said that piqued our interest. And some things we're, we're interested to see moving forward into spring. And then obviously into the summer. And then obviously the season when it gets here. But again, remember... It's very easy to get fired up about a press conference. You just hinted on it, hit on it. You know, you still got to see it on the field. Still got to see it in action. Got to see the action behind the words and the things that they're saying. But, yeah, there was some impressive stuff when hearing these guys talk. But, again, new staff, new era. USC needed some excitement after uh, eight and 8-5 season. They got it going into the, uh, the offseason here. So, yeah, looking forward to covering these uh, coaches and learning more about them and picking their brains Moving forward, hopefully we can, you know, chat them up again. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. We talked about this before where USC would be, you know, winning the offseason and maybe not so much during the season. And obviously the way the season ended uh, wasn't very positive, the final stretch of the regular season. But then you get a little bump from the Holiday Bowl. And were there five stars coming out of the transfer portal or signing on signing day just out of the woodwork? No, you didn't have that kind of influx of talent. There's some some good players that were added, but it wasn't like this overwhelming kind of like what Ohio state's doing right now. You're like, wow, they're just added dudes from everywhere. But the coaching staff, I think is what people are getting excited for. And Lincoln Riley talked about the development aspect of it. Maybe, you know, not getting out of the transfer portal business, but not relying on it as much pro program building where you're bringing in guys and developing them. And that's just not something that's been, that's like a different DNA, you know, from USC football of what we've known in the past. It's more about bringing in really talented players. Maybe don't get the best out of them and don't develop them and 
Uh, but you still have so many talented players, you can still do fine. It This feels like a, a shift of that. So kind of winning some of the offseason stuff in a more subdued way, subtle way, by hiring really good coaches as opposed to making splashes in other way. I guess, I don't know if you guys feel that way, but it seems like that's what USC has done this offseason. Yeah, and Riley mentioned Michigan as a program that they want to try to copy, and he talked about how five years ago Michigan was sort of in a similar place to USC. They had... Jim Harbaugh, but he, and he didn't say this specifically, but just to set the scene, that they had Jim Harbaugh, but maybe they weren't achieving at the level people had expected. And then some time goes by, and they just develop the crap out of some recruiting classes that were good, but maybe not great, like a Texas A&M or like an Ohio State. Like we see how those schools they win signing day, but they might not get it done on the field like a Michigan does. And I think with these hires, we know what USC is going to do in the NIL game. It's good, but it's a little bit different than some of these other schools and what they're relying on in recruiting is you're going to get developed. You're going to be part of a, a winning team because these coaches know what they're doing. These coaches will get you to the next level and we're going to win a lot of games. And that seems to be the, the view of Riley and where USC wants to go. They might not sign a top five or a top three class every year. I think that's pretty clear. But their whole slogan is their recruiting pitch. You come here, you're going to get developed. Look at all the guys we have on staff. And I think that's a lot better than it was a year ago. So that's a win in my book. Yeah, I like I like the word that you use, Ryan, the, the subtleness of it, of winning the offseason. You don't have to make a big show about what you're doing or what you've done in the offseason. I know some USC fans have been very uh, upset on social media about how no one in the national media is talking about the staff that Lincoln Riley has built. Like, no one, like, really batted an eye when they landed – Eric Henderson on social media, and I saw people complaining, of USC fans complaining about that. They're not getting any national attention for some of the guys that they picked up, but that should be fine with you. That should be okay with you. You you should be more worried about, you know, not winning in terms of, you know, all these people talking about how great you did in the offseason. You're going to know if you did great in the offseason if you win uh, 10 games the next year or, you know, get to a conference championship or, or all those kinds of things. So, yeah, it's a more subtle approach to it. Just go in and find good coaches. Work on your board. Like Lincoln Riley said, they had these seven guys. They got four of them. So that's pretty good. You know, if that was a recruiting visit weekend, you would say you did pretty good getting more than half of them. So I think uh, Lincoln likes what he's done here. He likes the group of guys. Sounded like they all liked each other when we were talking. I know there's a lot of, like, not – I'm not saying ego. I'm saying guys with experience, and there are you know three former defensive coordinators, one being a head coach and a national championship winning coach. So it's going to be interesting how the pieces work together. But you know, from what they said, everyone's going to bring their own ideas, give their own opinions. But you know, it's Danson Lynn's defense, and it's Lincoln Riley's team, and then everyone's here just to to learn and offer a different perspective because they have a bunch of guys from different backgrounds and you know coming from different parts of the country or different levels like the NFL so I think it's going to be interesting to see how it comes together this melting pot of a coaching staff yeah I think when you you talk about that are you going to be up in arms the USC got Eric Henderson it's a big deal I think just the way USC fans know kind of how to root for the program is you get these wins in the offseason oh Barrel Alexander or whoever like someone transferred in or they get this five star it's this offseason hype train Eric Henderson's the kind of guy that yeah okay uh, you, you can deep you know dig down deep into it and it's not going to be a national headline thing but a year or two from now is when you talk about that like you know what made the big difference why they made that run and won the big 10 in 2025 they brought in guys like Eric Henderson like you're going to get props for that if it works later on as opposed to you sign the five-star guy and then he fizzles out and nothing happens like this is you don't need props for hiring a defensive line coach, you know, as good as he could be. That's going to come later. Like when Michigan makes its run and you go back and look at the moves that were made and like, oh, yeah, Harbaugh did this or blah, blah, blah. Or when uh, Brian Kelly, you know, goes four and eight at Notre Dame and like fires his whole staff. Were you like gushing over every assistant that he brought in? No, but then they make the playoff and you're like, okay, so this worked, this worked. It's I think this is more of a you're going to talk about these guys later on. Like yeah, Doug Belk's great, or Mark Mark Edson, like you're, 
Matt, and you're going to talk about those guys more later on after the defense gets better. And you're like, this is why, because you brought in those guys. I, I just don't think this is going to be a, a lot of pre-hype out of side of like USC world where you're like, hey, we know who these guys are. Uh, you know, if you're covering the SEC or something, you're not like really concerned about that. But when you see USC's defense go from 110 to like 25 or something, then you're like, okay, now that's going to, you know, Denton Lynn, all these guys, then it makes a difference, I think. I think this is going to be more like you're going to get props later, not before before anything happens. Now we just have to see it and little signs of, of the coaching staff meeting with some players. They didn't give a ton away about scheme or about guys who've, made an impression on them just because it's all so new. But, Chris, I thought it was interesting. Matt Entz, without being asked about Eric Gentry, brought up Eric Gentry, wanting him to beef up a little bit so that way it'll be the most beneficial for him, someone who's going to play linebacker. That's what I took away from it. And I think just to what Ryan's saying, if Eric Gentry has a huge year, we're going to be talking about, obviously, his jump. But then it's, okay, I think Matt Entz made that big jump or helped him to make that big jump and Dent Danton Lynn helped him to make that big jump and we can't give those guys credit before it happens but I just thought it was interesting that Gentry was brought up today a player who was in some games for a ton of snaps had some nice moments had some not so nice moments sort of was up and down with injuries as well but I think someone we can all agree on is a real important player for that defense and for him to be brought up without being asked about it I thought was significant and now he's someone as the offseason rolls on people will want to hear about and want to learn about just what Eric Gentry's role is. And I'm excited to, to report on that. And we'll see what happens in spring practice where he ends up playing. It sounds like middle linebacker. And uh, I'm excited to see what happens with him. I just want to touch on that very briefly. As much as, you know, USC fans want to hear these coaches talk about, you know, players that they've inherited and, you know, talking about what their impressions are. None of the coaches gave any sort of early impressions about any individual players. As hard as, you know, Connor tried to get some quotes out of them. I nobody did. nobody took the bait. <laughs> nobody took the bait. The standard line was, ah, ask me in uh, spring camp. Ask me a couple weeks into spring camp. Then the line will be, ask me when the pads come yeah, on in spring yeah. camp. But, yeah, so before you all flood with questions about, oh, what do they say about this player? What do they say about this player? None of the new coaches were taking any bait in terms of, you know, naming this player, naming X player. What they thought of their position room, they all said it's too early. I believe they said their first team meeting was today. So still very much getting to know, you know, the guys in the room, their players. They've been mainly recruiting for the most part, you know, since they arrived in the, in the winter through the period. And now, you know, obviously they were on the road for a lot of weeks. So now they're just getting into the period of like really starting to look at the defense, really starting to look at their position groups, look at their, their individual players. So yeah, none of the coaches today gave any sort of specifics on any player, except for a couple instances, like you mentioned with Eric Gentry. There and were a couple of those. Kamari Ramsey, he was at, Doug Buck was asked specifically about him, and he had some nice things to say about him, which makes me think he'll he'll be an impact guy. But you're right, it was very early for, for a lot of that. And I was trying. So Eric Gentry <laughs> was one, and, and Kamari Ramsey was another, the safety transfer from UCLA. But you're right, Chris. Pretty, I, I, I think... Going in, that the staff was told, even if you have, have had some impressions, like let's not go there today. Right. I just wanted to cut it off before we got a bunch of questions. <laughs> like, what do they say about uh, Mason Cobb? Tell yeah. me what they say right. about Mason Cobb. Yeah. Right. Nothing. Nothing. Today. We got another uh, super chat. Oh. Thanks, uh, Giovanni. Um, USC just added four men who will absolutely make sure this defense gives maximum effort every game, every snap, every practice. I like that. Yeah, I think uh, it was funny. I did a podcast of champions with David Woods yesterday. And, you know, UCLA, Chip Kelly leaves for the OC job at Ohio State. They hired Deshaun Foster, who, you know, it was basically been a running backs coach, never been a coordinator. But there was, you got to find, you know, what's the positive about it. Like, he cared. Like, you could see the press conference, he cared. And I feel like the same thing. Like, these are guys that want to win. They care about winning. Like they're going to do whatever they can to uh, get this. So, I mean, it, that you can tell just from like, listening to those guys that this is going to be, they know how bad this defense was and they want to, they want to turn it around. At least that's the impression I got. Effort can cover up a lot of deficiencies. Effort can cover up a lot of uh, maybe deficiencies in talent. If your effort, especially as a defense, you can, you could work with that. So, I think that's a a good point that Giovanni makes. I do think it all comes down to 
the defensive line and what production USC gets there. And we don't have to have a fall camp conversation in February. But I, I, I looking at the roster, I feel like the linebackers adding Easton Mascarenas Arnold is significant, and USC they're going to play with two linebackers. So him and then whoever else wins the job and rotating other guys in, I, I like what they have there. And the secondary, I like what they have. To me, what's going to make or break USC with all these great coaches is the production they get on their defensive line. And Danton Lynn was so good at UCLA, but there were better players on the defensive line. I think we can say that for sure. And USC, it's going to be a little bit different. That'll be where I'll be focusing a lot of my attention during the spring. Well, why don't we do this? Let's go through kind of each coach one by one. Um, and you know, get, both give you guys some. You can both give some highlights of uh, what you heard from there. We talked about some of what like Lincoln Riley had said. I'd mentioned the the coaching staff aspect of him thinking it was the best staff in football. Um, you know, he talked about Miller Moss. Uh, you know, being in a quarterback competition a little bit. But any kind of thing, anything that stands out from from what Lincoln Riley had to say. Do you want to start? I mean. The the headliners were obviously the defensive coaches. It was a pretty standard Lincoln Riley presser, if you will. You know, a lot about the process of finding these guys, how they came to, you know, get connected with these guys. Most of them, you know, they knew through certain connections. You know, once they made the defensive coordinator hire with Lynn, everything else started, you know, moving into place. And I, a lot of a lot of it was around Coach Henderson because everyone – views him as the, uh, excuse me, Coach Henny, view him as the crown jewel of this defensive staff just coming from the NFL. And, you know, did they think they would have a shot at getting Coach Henderson? And, you know, Lincoln Riley said, I'm in a place like USC. I think that means we have a shot with anyone. And I think that was one of the big things. You know, he is uber confident in what this place or what USC is and, you know, what that program can be. And he was asked about, you know, coaches leaving to the NFL, you know, college coaches leaving and that trend and what made him want to stay and stay at USC. He was like, because he wants to he wants to bring it back. He wants to – he wants it so bad, quote, so bad he wants to, you know, bring USC to the USC of, you know, old and, and get it to where it was as a national prominent team. And that was kind of one of the big – things that stuck out in my head about, you know, how badly he wants it to succeed at USC. I asked Lincoln about the strengths of each of the new coaches, and he talked about Danton Lynn being a great teacher, and that is something they're really emphasizing. They want to make sure that their defense is simple and easy to comprehend. Coach Entz, Lincoln said, is hard-nosed, really tough, understands the game, sees all 11 positions really well. He talked about how with Coach Henderson, great energy and confidence – and then with Coach Belk, he understands all 11 very well, tremendous with relationships, but also does a nice job of holding people accountable. And I might be reading into that too much, but Chris, to me, that sounded like a little bit of a knock on Dante Williams, who was the relationship guy on the previous staff, the cornerbacks coach on the previous staff, who maybe had all those great relationships with a lot of really talented recruits, but didn't do the best job of holding guys accountable. I thought it was interesting that Lincoln... When he was talking about Doug Belk, he mentioned the relationships that he has with his players are huge, but he does a nice job of holding those guys accountable, too. Yeah, it's interesting to hear when you have new coaches come in, especially a whole new staff. You're, you're listening for the knocks. You're listening to uh, – <laughs> and we'll have some of those with Coach Entz. Coach Entz gave the most, like, little knocks oh. At, oh, yeah. at the linebacker group, so we'll talk about that when we talk about him. But, yeah, always always key to, 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 to hear for those little uh, those little subtle subtle phrases and words. There, jabs. Yeah. Well, I think especially when you have a down season, you're always and or you know when Lincoln Riley got hired, you wanted to talk about all the failures of the previous you know uh, coaching regime with with Clay Helton and stuff. And now you had pretty much a catastrophic defensive failure, uh, where almost the entire staff is gone. And now you want to like, hey, tell us all the things that were terrible about. We always thought it was terrible. Tell us why that was terrible. You know, that's what people want to know. And you don't necessarily want to like kick people on their way out the door, but, uh, you know, little things will come up. So I'll be, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are uh, on those things. So should we start with uh, the defensive coordinator? Lincoln Riley made it clear, even though Eric Henderson is listed as co-defensive coordinator, this is Danton Lynn's uh, defense. He was, uh, after Lincoln Riley went, 
about 28 minutes or so of uh, Danton Lynn, obviously coming over from UCLA, longtime NFL assistant. I would say in general, um, not the most dynamic speaker, I guess, you know, but he's, I think the words meant a lot what he was saying, but it's not someone you're going to be like, engage, like it wasn't the most engaging uh, press conference I've ever heard, but uh, kind of get your initial thoughts on Danton Lynn. That's fine. That's fine. I mean, yeah. I'm not, I'm not trying to be, I'm, I'm not knocking Alex Grinch, but that man could talk for a simple question. He could go a yes. long time. So this is, it feels like the exact opposite. And I wonder I, if that's on purpose. I, like, I, I, <laughs> he, the other guy was really good at answering questions, but the defense was terrible. Like, and I, I warn people <laughs> when this is the first time, like listening to Danton speak after, you know, researching him a little bit in the off season, it's like, he's not a long talker. he, Says what he needs to what he needs to say, and that's it. It's it can be very short, it could be even short as well. So, you know, I get this uh, calming presence. I think someone, uh, I think Lincoln Riley said calm and patience when it comes to uh, Danton Lynn. But that's the, the what I get from him just listening to him, him speak. And I could hear him speak all day. Obviously, it'd be very short sound bites about it. But I think obviously he's coming from an NFL background. He's obviously very smart. He's still learning the college game, but is is has humility and knowing that he is still learning the college game and learning college recruiting and doesn't seem to have any sort of real ego. I mean, as for being a young, uh, very young coach, a uh, very young defensive coordinator. Um, I like, I like Denton Lynn. I liked what by, I was hearing from him and the biggest thing I, I had from him and I'm sure you're going to talk about it, but how he's going to go super slow with this install of this scheme. And he mentioned how, you know, when they installed it in the spring at UCLA, they went so slow, so much so that some of the players were a little bit annoyed about how slow they were installing his defense. But he said, I'd rather go too slow than too fast. I really want to teach it to them, get it in there, build that foundation for this defense, build those fundamentals, and then we can start, you know, adding, adding, and adding. But not too much, because obviously it's going to be more simple, but that was kind of the the key thing he said to me is that you know this install is going to be slow and it's going to be meticulous because they want to get it right. I liked how he said we want to make a little look like a lot, and I think when you read into what Kyle Shanahan does in the NFL on offense, that is his philosophy. Yeah, we maybe only have 16 plays, but 16 plays can turn into 100 plays really quick based on little movements here or there, and we can tweak what we do. Uh, like our basics, we could tweak those and a little bit will look like a lot. And I think that is right now sort of the best coaches subscribe to that theory. So that was really encouraging to see. I liked how he talked about, he didn't really get into the X's and O's, but when he was asked about his scheme, he said, obnoxious communication, shocking effort, and we want to attack. Sounds pretty good to me. I think the communication last year was terrible. And Coach Entz talked about it. Uh, Matt Entz, the new linebacker coach, Danton Lynn hinted on it there. They really want to communicate better and make sure everyone is on the same page because, I mean, we've been over it on the show a million times. How many times last year is Christian Roland Wallace waving to the sideline? I don't know what I'm doing. I don't Look, know what I'm looking doing. Looking at the, uh, the bands. Grinch is buried in the, his little note card, and <laughs> it was a nightmare, and then a gain of 20 happened. So I think the, the communication that was – I don't want to say it was a knock on, on the last staff because you got to communicate to play good defense, uh, and it's clearly a tenant with Lynn. But I, I really like to go back to what I said at first, just making – a little bit look like a lot. I think that is what it, it makes a good football coach right now and a good defense, a good offense, and, and that's what USC is trying to do. Especially in college. And I, if you remember back from the Pete Carroll days, uh, Norm Chow being the offensive coordinator, I think the if you would ask him about it, I've talked to him about this before, it's like you want it to look complicated yep. and be simple. We've seen people run offenses and defenses in college that – are very complicated to run and they don't look that hard from the def from the other side. It's like you're you're really hurting yourself. You're doing yourself a disservice. You get a very limited window with college players. They are 18 to 22 year olds for the most part. You can't make things so complicated. And that's what it felt like with with Alex Grinch's scheme that the guys constantly didn't know what they were doing. Um, and you could say, well, everyone's dumb or you need to change what you're doing. You know, it's like if, if you're a teacher and everyone's failing your class over and over and over again, you say, oh, my students don't get it. Well, you're probably doing something wrong. Like there's a common thread here. The common denominator is you and not everybody else. 
And so I think that's really refreshing to hear from Denton Lynn because you do want that aspect where it's only 16 plays, but there's little offshoots and things, and you're not going to know what's coming, but our players are going to know what's what to do. Like if you need the opponent to not know what's going to happen, but you know your players know what to do. So I think that the, the fact that he emphasized that I thought was really encouraging. I also wanted to jump on something else he said okay. when he was asked to kind of talk about his his defense and kind of like the influences that it ha has and he called it a melting pot and i th i was i was thinking about this as he was talking about it like i hope people aren't going to interpret it interpret this as like the clay helton uh, gumbo offense which is just like trying to throw a bunch of things together but there's a fine line between a gumbo system and a melting pot system his being you know influenced by Mike McDonald and Gus Bradley and Rex Ryan and, you know, the philosophies of the Baltimore Ravens, which is obviously like one of the most established defensive lineages in the NFL yeah. and the Houston Texans for decades, yeah. for decades. Ken Norton, he was talking about how he's, he was been pulling all these different things and all these little things and he has built his own system. And, you know, that's what the gumbo offense thought it was doing, I guess which is where you're trying to take all these things and throw them together. But if you actually know what you're doing as a coordinator and, you know, obviously as a young talent coach like Danton Lynn, you know, this is what he is, has confidence in. And this is what, oh, I really like this that, you know, Rex Ryan taught me. And I really like this what Ken Norton taught me. And obviously I want to keep this, this thread that, you know, I picked up and philosophy I picked up with the Baltimore Ravens. I want to keep that together. So it, he's just taking what he likes from different things and, putting them together and if you know what you're doing and you're a good architect you can build you know a real system and so that's what i was just kind of thinking about when i heard him you know describe it as a melting pot and it kind of and on the flip side of that you have a gumbo offense yeah that, you know usc fans have are familiar with i think the key to that is editing where it's mm -hmm. not just like you could add 15 chapters but you can't add everything from all of them you know you're you're editing it down and putting the right parts together Gumbo is really just like throwing stuff and see what sticks and like, oh, I saw that. So someone ran that cool play. I'm going to try. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to try that. You remember like when Stanford started to do, um, what's the Wake Forest offense? The, uh, mesh? the yeah, the slow the mesh. They just mesh. started doing that. And you're like, what are you doing? Like, that's just someone else's thing. You're, you know, try to like pieces of that or whatever. That The Gumbo just didn't work. I mean, that's not. That's not looking at something and realizing I, I want this part of that. It's just like, oh, let's try this thing and add. The, and it doesn't make any sense where what he's doing is here's my base and I can like add this, but I'm going to take this out. And, and you're the, the fact that you can edit that and put that together makes a lot of sense. But you have to be a good coach for that. Danton Lynn's a good coach. Whatever they were trying to do with the gumbo offense, that was not good coaching. It does sound like with Danton Lynn, a lot of opposites to Alex Grinch. I remember Alex Grinch was asked about his install during either practice or at some point before the season, and he said, we want to throw everything at the guys and then go from there. Start by throwing everything at them and then break it down. And it seems like Nathan Lynn's going to do the opposite of that. The communication stuff, like I hit on, it just seems like it's a totally different perspective from, from where USC was a year ago, and I think it all goes back to Lincoln Riley admitting, hey, I got this one wrong. Yeah. And uh, there I just want to say quickly, he also said that there's built-in flexibility with the scheme where they can tweak it and move it, and it can kind of – it's like a living thing where it can kind of grow and shape into different things, where I felt like the previous was just kind of, this is what it is. Let's put people in to mold it to the scheme while this one feels more adaptive and You're reactive right. to what USC has in those rooms and then, you know, what they're bringing in and kind of, kind of that – that kind of uh, philosophy. We yeah. want run to look like blitz. Remember Alex Grinch said that? What? Every <laughs> single time? Like, you're telling on yourself. We want run to look like blitz. I'll never forget when he said that. That's pretty funny. Um, Giovanni had a question or a comment that I wanted you guys to comment on this. I don't remember if it was from Riley or from Danton Lynn, but he said, I love that they're going to try to reevaluate the practice format right now. Lincoln, you know what to do, man. Um, that was Lynn. Danton Lynn talked about like, you know, reevaluating how they practice. Yeah, I don't know if he said the word reevaluating, but he said that they just had their first meetings and they're also starting, I think he was saying like this week or, or next week, that they're going to start looking at practice and how to structure it and how, the, how to best move forward for the defense and the offense. So 
you know, if we're looking at, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean more physical practices? Uh, I don't know, but yeah, definitely, obviously, they're looking at restructuring or changing or tweaking or seeing how it best fits. Like, hey, this is what I did at UCLA. Obviously, it worked for for us last year. So, yeah, I think that they're having those discuss are going to start having those dis discussions. I'm sure they've talked a little bit more about it than they let on, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they they didn't want to reveal anything. Right. Um, and I, I, I have starred a bunch of questions. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, put question. I will start. We'll come back to it later on in the show and answer your question. But I want to move on to uh, Eric Henderson, um, who fan favorite over there, like you guys had mentioned. Anything kind of stand out from what the uh, former Rams uh, assistant had to say? We move into Henderson now? Yeah. Is that okay. good? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Coach Henny, I took the first last one, so do you want to? Or? Sure, just when he's talking about his mentality and the, the whole dog work thing and how what's your coaching style, aggressive, he says his spiel, but what really stood out to me, Chris and Ryan, was that he, he's saying the spiel and he's so passionate about it, and you can like see it in his face, where I, I just thought that was interesting. You see a lot of coaches, they're like used car salesmen, and they'll just try to say the right thing, but I, I could really feel like when Eric Henderson is talking, he really believes in what he's saying and he trusts his own process he got in at the end of it uh, about a lot of he had a very difficult upbringing where he never knew his father and his mom passed away when he was at a young age and then he lived with his grandmother and she passed away and then his aunt took him in and she passed away he just all these awful experiences happened to him and he overcame it and he said i'm tough and he's the kind of guy who when he says he's tough you know like, oh, okay oh tough guy he's like okay this guy is tough and i just I think he's really authentic. I buy what he's he's selling, and, and I, I could see what he's saying in his face. He really means everything that he says. I can see why he's killing it on the recruiting trail. We had the comment earlier about running through a brick wall for him. I feel the same exact way, and I do think – I wrote about this on our site a couple weeks ago. I really do think that he is going to be able to land some elite guys because he is, is such an authentic person, and I, I believe he's a really good coach, and I, I think USC got a good one with Eric Henderson. Yeah, everyone had mentioned previously about his energy, and I'm not saying he wasn't energetic when he was when he was at the podium, but you could under you see how oh this guy's probably a, a lot more hyped out on the field when he's coaching, but you had that kind of confidence that he carried himself with, and you saw the energy. Obviously, I I, I assume he toned it down for a press conference like situation, but you can see like this guy comes off as really genuine. He you know was, had. You know, a tough upbringing, as you mentioned, and he said how that made him physically tough, but also mentally tough. And he yeah. understands, you know, a lot of situations that kids are going through. And that's why he's, you know, so good with relationships. That's he loves talking to people, loves meeting new people. And Denton Lynn said it like you're going to see when he walks in this room and he starts talking to you, you're going to see that energy and that confidence that he has. And that's why he could walk into any room in the country and recruit any kid because he's just like that. And I believed him just like, you know, seeing him talk up there. He was at ease with when anyone, you know, was repeating people's names. And, you yeah. know, he was just he just had that very little. Personable. Yeah, very personal. But he just had that little extra charm. Yeah, a little extra charm to, to whoever he was talking to. You know, you know, he's the guy who's coached, you know, the best defensive lineman in the world. But I, he didn't get the sense that he thought he was better than you. And he was just like, no. yeah, he was just, you know, he's great at what he does. And he loves doing what he does, and that's coaching football and developing kids. And obviously, Coach Henderson was the 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 star everyone wanted to see, you know, because of the the waves he's or hear about from today and hear him speak because he's made waves, you know, on social media and already on the recruiting trail, hitting it hitting it very hard. But you know, it wasn't anything he said about you know, oh, I like this type of player or we need to get bigger. I, it's just the way he talked about people and making those connections, you know. There's, he said there isn't anything specific I look at when I'm recruiting a kid. Like, he has to have this kind of wingspan or he has to have, you know, this much weight on him or he has to have, be this tall or, or anything like that. He said, I, I like to look within a kid I'm recruiting. I like to look at them and see, hey, how can I help this kid? How can I help this person? And then do they want to get better? It seems like the only requisite for him is someone who is driven to get better and improve and, you know, reach their next potential as a football player and obviously as a young man. 
So I think I think that was one of the things that really stuck out to me, you know, in all the questions he was asked about recruiting, just how he looks, you know, to that other quality in a kid, just that that inner stuff. And I think that's what makes him so successful as a recruiter and, you know, getting to connect with, you know, not just high school kids, but, you know, anyone he comes across. And, and just real quick, he was asked about who are his coaching influences, and he brought up his high school coach. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, just sums him up. Like, he's a guy, relationships really, really matter. And I don't think, I asked a few other coaches, no one else brought up their, their high school coach as a, as a coaching influence. And I think that just sort of sums up Eric Henderson to a T right there. People who look out for him and who really helped him along the way, he mentioned all these different coaches, but the fact that he mentioned his high school coach, someone from way back when – when he was growing up in the New Orleans area, that was significant to me because I, I feel like he's going to be the same way. And when he helps and coaches someone who, who's younger at USC now and they have that bond, when they leave and go to the NFL or maybe don't even continue to play football afterwards, that bond matters to him. And I, I, I think the word I keep going back to is authentic. And, and I think that really in this NIL world and you can have the cars and everything, that is, of course, important. But – his authenticity as well as his track record, I think, can separate him from a lot of other coaches. And I really – I keep saying this. I, I think it's going to lead to results on the recruiting trail. So I'm excited to see what happens. It's interesting that the one coach, the one assistant coach that is new – that is getting the most sort of recruiting hype yeah. is the NFL guy, not the guy that came – from college, and I know, I think it was someone on the Peristyle, and my apologies, maybe it was in the chat too. People were sort of making parallels between Eric Henderson and Ed Orgeron. And if you had ever met Ed Orgeron, he was the same kind of guy. He remembers your name. He you repeat the, you, repeat, you know, he made, when you would talk to him, he made it feel like you were the like you were important. And it's like that's like a, you know, like a kind of a politician thing. Like when you're recruiting, just being able to connect with people like that. If, if you have a conversation with someone and it just feels good, you're willing to have that conversation again. And it seems like Eric Henderson, Eric Henderson kind of has that personality besides being like an energetic, fiery defensive line coach, but also that, that the interpersonal relationships Ed Orgeron was just really good at it, and it seems like Eric Henderson is too. Denton Lynn did bring up the Henderson. He was a grad assistant at Oklahoma State, and then he spent one year at uh, University of Texas, San Antonio, UTSA. And he, even though it was only three years, was known as being a, a good recruiter. And then he goes to the NFL, so it's been a while. But I, I think he developed that reputation for a few years as a beginning coach in, in college, and now we're seeing it as he's way more established. It, it's paying off. Yeah, if you're good at it, I mean, you could be really good at it. You could be really good at riding a bike and just never get on a bike for three years and you get back on. Like, <laughs> like he's a really good recruiter. Like, a lot of it's just your personality. You have to be, you know, authentic. Like, the word that's come up, you know, natural. Like, if you're just good at that, it's kind of like, oh, you're funny. You don't tell a joke for a while. You're probably still funny later on. Like, he's he has the, the traits that make someone a very good recruiter. And even if you're not using that, you can come back and it's still part of it's it's part of his DNA. It's part of his personality, I would think. He uh he was asked about in talking about his DNA and his personality, he was asked about, you know, like why would you want to, you know, give up a pretty good job in the NFL to come to college, which is, you know, a lot of college coaches are going to the NFL to yes, get away it's the other way. From yeah, he's doing the reversal thing. And he was like, you know, he he, he said and was one of his best quotes was like, he wants quote, all the smoke that comes with a college <laughs> game. He wanted it all. He wanted to go up against everything that comes with a college game, including recruiting. He especially said recruiting because that is just who he is. He loves building relationships. He loves yeah. talking to people. He loves meeting new people, which is obviously what recruiting is. It's just yeah. building those relationships. He's like, that's who I am. That is me. That is in my DNA. So, you know, that, what you were just mentioning, but I thought that was a, a great way you said it. Like he wants all the smoke. He wants <laughs> everything that comes with a college game. You know, it's, it's a grind at the college level. It's a grind yes. at the NFL level. It's a different kind of grind. And I know some people were commenting like, Oh, why would he want to come to college and deal with like prima Donna five stars? You don't think there are prima Donnas in the NFL level. <laughs> you don't think the prima Donna, you have to handle those egos and those prima Donnas from guys who are making, you know, grown men making millions of dollars. Yeah, it's, it's the same game, just you know, a little bit different in some aspects. So, yeah, and I've been trying to remember, Connor, what the A in dog work stands for. It's discipline. I can't remember work ethic and 
grit. Not aggression or... That's what I thought it was, aggression. I'd have to go back and look, though. I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it's aggression or attention to detail, but I think it's... it it might be attention to detail. But that was what the dog work is, and so a man whose literal... uh, His literal motto is dog work, I think he'll be fine. At any level, obviously, he's super successful in the NFL, and he's been successful at the college level, albeit small sample size. I think he's going to put in the dog work at USC. (laughs) Blackie Chan wants to see that on a shirt. He says it would sell. Dog work? Uh, yeah. Well, it's probably it's his, so uh, you should you should. Uh, he can put on a shirt. Work work with House of Victory. Make some money for NIL yeah, or something. Absolutely. Make some for him. All right. Uh, should we move on? Uh, yeah. You want to do some else. linebacker? Uh, Matt Entz coming in. You know, you who do you want to coach your linebackers? Ah, uh, some guy that won a couple national championships as a head coach, and comes down. Uh, so this was a big you know big coup for. Lincoln Riley, you don't think a guy like that who's winning, you know, championships uh, at this level would come, uh, but he did, and I think that's someone that Riley's really proud of bringing in. But what did what kind of stood out from what uh, Matt Entz uh, said from you guys? He's a guy that – sorry to cut you off, Chris. Good? He just needs a little juice right now. He said he interviewed for an FBS job, and they said you have no FBS coaching experience, and that made him kind of – he took that personally. Yeah, he, and he took that personally. And the so, Michael Jordan meme, he took that personally. Uh, he, he talked about how being attached to Lincoln Riley and Danton Lynn was important to him, and he, he didn't shy away from saying when he was talking to Lincoln Riley at first, I want to be in your chair one day. So he's a guy who is looking to, to boost up the resume and talked about betting on himself a little bit. He said, in a way, you're betting on yourself every year, but I think this is a little bit of a different circumstance because he was a head coach at the – uh, FBS level and now, or the Division One AA level. What is it? I get that mixed up, but not. It used to be one AA. What is it? F- FCS. FCS, FCS, not FBS. Um, and now I lost my train of thought. Of course, but he's You'll betting get it on back. himself. Get it back. He he just he, he just needs some juice around him, and he thinks partnering with Lincoln Riley and Danton Lynn that'll help get him noticed. And if he turns the linebacker room around and and helps USC produce a competent defense, that could open some doors for him. And I thought that was interesting because when you're recruiting, it's kind of hard to be like, hey, I'm maybe going to leave in a couple of years, but you should come to play at USC. So I don't know how that's all going to work, but uh, he, he hasn't shied away from, from wanting to move on in the future, and, and he has big goals, so I guess that's good. Yeah. Real yeah. quick, uh, Blackie Chan says, discipline, attitude, work ethic, Ad- grit. Attitude. Attitude. Attitude, yeah. So just Show me attitude. You. <laughs> <laughs> You're pointing there, but for everyone, uh, yeah, we do our show here on YouTube if you're listening on the podcast. The main thing we do is uscfootball.com. You can see the logo right behind those guys over there. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, you should get over there and do it. We do this stuff all year round. Tons of content going up. RJ's been putting up three burning questions for every assistant coach. So many co- cool things of content going up on over at uscfootball.com. If you're not a subscriber, you can get 30% off a, an annual membership so make sure you go check it out we don't mention it enough because you just assume people go there but a lot of people are just like on their youtube pages but if you want to go get this kind of content video stuff podcast but also uh, a lot of written words uh go, and uh the, the peristyle is great as far as the message board goes a lot of stuff going on over there make sure you check out uscfootball.com all right back to your mac matt Entz uh anecdotes i just wanted to say with coach henderson that was the every what everyone wanted to hear from was coach henny but I think I came away maybe most impressed with Matt Entz. I didn't really know a lot about him. Obviously, you know, he's a national championship winning coach. But just hearing him talk, I was really impressed with him up there. Obviously, he had head coaching presence. Like, if you had not told us yeah. which one of the guys. Yeah, an opening statement. Yeah, he, he was head coach coded. He was just still in head coaching mode. If you hadn't told us which of the four had been a head coach, I would have bet everyone in this room's lives that it was Matt Enns. That's the way he carried himself. And you're right. He wasn't, you know, shy about saying, you know, I want to be a head coach at the next level, this FBS level. And he said, my goal is to be the best linebackers coach I can be. But I'm also here to learn and soak up as much as I can for the future, which is, you know, the opportunities that I want to build to. And he mentioned, you know, the coaches that he would hire are the coaches that had bigger aspirations down the line. Those are the coaches coaches that he wanted to bring in to his program, and Lincoln Riley would say the same thing. He said, Lincoln Riley would probably say the same thing. You want those coaches that you know aspire to move up, be great somewhere, and then keep getting better and better. And that's what he's trying to do uh, with his choice to come to uh, Los Angeles. 
He didn't make a joke that his wife and his dog are happy with the choice so far with the weather that, uh, you know, they've been finding out here in Los Angeles. So obviously, that the weather's been kind of crappy, to be honest, since they've come here. But oh, whatever. well, not compared to a North Dakota. That's that. fair not enough. Not compared yeah. to a North Dakota. And I interviewed a kid the other day from St. Louis, and it was raining. And I was like, uh, you're probably a little bummed about the weather. He said, are you kidding me? This is great weather. So I'm compared oh, yeah. compared to where he's coming from, this is like For us, the this best was the worst weather we've ever had. Yeah, look and at you. Like, this Have some the- perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, have some perspective. You could be in North Dakota freezing your butt off, shutting off your water. That could be you. That could be you. I don't want to ever have to start my car early again. You remember? You probably remember doing that, Connor. Like, where you oh. like, yeah. Like, we're both from New England, <laughs> you know, and just like, yeah, go outside. And I guess now you can remote do it. But when I was a kid, no Not way. Not with my Honda Civic, you can't. <laughs> do you guys have those little ice scrapers? Oh, hell yeah. You had, you had to have the ice scrapers. I, I mean, wanted my car and someone saw it. Who lived here and was like, "What is this?" And I was like, "You don't, you don't." Why do you have one still? You never know. You never know when you're. Yes, you have do. To. You know, you don't need that. <laughs> I mean, maybe you're like an attacker or something, like a carjacker. You could hit them with the sure. ice scraper. Sure. You never know when you'll need an ice scraper for ice or for to protect yourself. Um, uh, Miles said, "I'm going to put this up here." Uh, Ents impressed me the most too. I like the statements of having a staff of coaches that aspire to be head coaches. He's smooth. He, he's a he's a good talker. He I, I remember when he was doing a press conference at North Dakota State right before their big playoff game, and he was asked why do you take the job. It, the news had just broken the day before, and I wrote that story on our, our site. And he really impressed me there. Impressed me today. I, I I think he says all the right things, and I'm excited to watch him in action. How about he brought up modern day too? Um, whoa, 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 whoa. Little, uh, little tip of the hat to modern day. A little, yeah. little, little secret recruiting there, I yeah. think, maybe a little bit. USC has struggled bringing in guys from, from modern day the last couple cycles. He said, we want to recruit winners. We're not going to campuses of high schools that are 1 and 11 and recruiting those guys most of the time. And then he brought up modern day. We want to go to schools like that where they win, where they're successful, where they produce top talent. And I thought that was interesting. And Shout out to him because we don't get a lot of little recruiting nuggets from any of these guys, and this guy's new, and he gave us a little nugget. He also said it. at the end they need to keep the best players in California home. Yeah. So he was doing everything he could to win <laughs> the press conference. He was saying everything that USC fans wanted to hear. That's good. Especially when he talked about the linebackers, which we were teasing earlier, but some some little jabs at the room. Yeah, wants Eric West. Gentry to beef up to, to 220. How many times have we seen that on the Peristyle? Maybe that's not necessarily Eric Gentry's fault, though. No, but, no, no. But just the, what he was saying about, you know, if you're reading between the lines, you know, he was talking about how, you know, talking about what he saw from the UC linebackers kind of last yeah, year. Yeah, well, let's which, get into that. Oh. <laughs> where, you know, they were thinking too much. He was like, there's too much being put on them, too much communication pre-snap or be, things being changed. And, you know, your legs get heavy and your reaction is slow. They don't want them thinking out there. They want them reacting out there. Yeah. And, you know, he, he – I don't think he was asked about specifically about, you know, last year. No, he was, and he said, I'm not going to answer that, and then he did. Well, that was – that was – well, that was – I think that Those was the before. Best. I'm not going to answer that, that before. But... If I'm, my memory serves me right, he was talking about that before, and then someone followed up with a more detailed question about that, and then he was like, I'm not getting that. But it was like, Coach, you're already talking about yeah, what yeah. you were seeing and kind of basically said the linebackers last year – played too slow they were thinking too much too complicated and basically says you know we want to simplify it and he i feel like he was saying that based on you know, talking to some of the guys and kind of what they were looking for and and that's kind of what my impression so they're, was they're describing like well i was supposed to do this and then uh, he's yeah, like just, whoa 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 uh, that's just, just just too much yeah too much being going on simplify it you, your linebackers you need to attack 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 if you, you can't attack if you're like okay but if if i'm going this way and then he's going that way the play's already gone by so you need to be able to just attack yeah no i think that i love that what he was saying there and what you guys were talking about you know hiring aspiring head coaches and all that uh i think it was colin cowherd who would when usc would have a bunch of weird hires and stuff going on and he had he told me this he's like a's hire a's and b's hire c's so like if you're an A, you want to surround yourself with other A's. You want other people that are really good. What I was, what did I harp on for years and years? Athletic director, coaches, hire people that are good at their jobs. Like Lincoln Riley is obviously good at his job. 
is he going to win a championship? I don't know. But, I mean, he's he's been good enough to make playoffs, win Heisman. He's good at his job. Uh, we'll see how good he is taking over USC, turning over, whatever. But he's someone that has been really good at his job. So you're going to go hire people that are also good at their job. When you're a B, you're not necessarily looking for A's because they can replace you. You know, it's like you're hiring people below you, and you're never going to kind of get that. You're, you're, you're never going to be able to raise the program to the level it needs to be. And I feel like that's kind of where USC's been, not just with coaches, but with you know, athletic directors and all that stuff in the past too. So finally going out and hire some A's that make good decisions, people that are good at their jobs, and, and you get something like this where, yeah, do you get Matt Entz for like five years? No, he's going to be around for a year or two, but that's okay. If you remember the one hire um, – that uh, Clay Helton made, and I'm blanking on his name. It's going uh, to the Dylan McCullough. Dylan McCullough uh, yes. paradox. I, you, I did that the last time too. I think we talked. I about was this. in the room. You were in the room. I and you, literally you mentioned shouted again. out Dylan McCullough, and I forgot it again. Um, but he I'm stayed, here. I'm here now, Ryan. It's he stayed okay. for one year, but yeah. he was a really good running backs coach. And just go get another one now. Like keep hiring people that are going to get other jobs. Like that's okay because you're getting good people. Like, Nick, it's not easy. To replace coordinators year after year. Nick Saban, best ever to do it, did it a lot. But you want to hire guys that other people are going to want, not that you have to fire eventually because and they're terrible and they move down. Like if you hire someone to be your DC and then he's a graduate assistant next year for somebody else, you probably didn't do a very good job. So, yes, I, I love this. Uh, Lincoln's an A, trying to hire more A's and bringing a really good staff. And when you do that, you're going to get good results. Why do you think the best coaches have coaching trees? Yes. Because they hire A's and they move out and become their own head coaches. Yeah. So. All right. We got one more. Uh, Doug Belk, uh, former defensive coordinator over at Houston, coming in to coach the secondary. Uh, put his photo up there. What did you guys, uh, what were your impressions uh, from Doug Belk? Pretty. A little hard to hear. A little hard to hear. Um, so Soft-spoken guy. Um you know, pretty standard. I mean, nothing as, you know, that stood out as much as, you know, Coach Lynn or Coach Ants or Henderson, for that matter. He was a nice, you know, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Like Even keeled? Even keeled finisher to a day of, you know, people, uh, Coach Henderson making people want to run through walls. It was a nice little, little finisher, you know, talked about, you know, kind of his background, West Coast being a new challenge for him. You know, coming, you know, being from the SC kind of country and, you know, coaching in Texas. And this is a new challenge for him. He'll be taking over the entire defensive back room. He's going to be coaching both cornerbacks and safeties. You know, we talked about how he thinks that's a good thing. Just, you know, there'd be cr cross training guys. You can see kind of the bigger picture that way, working with both. And he has worked with both. And, you know, he did say Lynn, Coach Lynn is obviously a safety coach. A defensive back coach by trade so he'll be in there you know they'll be putting their heads together coaching these guys but for the most part Lynn is going to be focusing being a defensive coordinator being the guy who oversees the defense you know that was different from last year when you know coach Grinch was the DC and coaching the safeties be more of Doug Belt Doug Belk working with both groups with Lynn you know offering a more support support role but his main goal is you know building that defense and overseeing everything I asked Doug Belk in his conversations with Lincoln Riley about his defensive philosophy and ideally how they play defense. What are, what are those like? And he said, first, we need to change the narrative. And I thought that was really interesting because what have we been talking about for years since the end of that first season with Lincoln Riley? It's that the narrative and the perception around the defense is that it's terrible. No one knows what they're doing. Lincoln Riley isn't a defensive coach. He's offense only, and he, he doesn't care about defense. So I thought that – Doug Belk coming out and saying step one, changing the narrative, that really stood out to me because I think that is one of the most critical things facing USC when it comes to recruiting and just when it comes to defense in general. There is that perception, that narrative that with Lincoln Riley, you're going to get a Heisman winning trophy, quarter, get a <laughs> Heisman trophy winning quarterback uh, more often than not. But defensively, it's sort of a, who knows what's going to happen. And they got to do a better job of changing the narrative around that. Doug Belk mentioning that stood out to me. I thought that was really significant. All righty. Um, anything else on uh, Doug Belk? He he had a, some nice things to say about Kamari Ramsey, which okay. makes me feel like they think he's going to be a really big impact. Coming over player. from uh, UCLA? Mm -hmm. he, yeah. He talked about 
true freshman Braylon Connolly being a corner nickel or safety, not really knowing exactly where he'll fit in. Talked about being a teacher, like Danton Lynn. He had some stuff to say about NIL and Nick Saban. That was really it, though. I, and I need to go back and listen because I was in the second row and I had a little bit of trouble hearing him. He did mention Jalen Smith being a guy yeah. who could play Everything. cornerback, yeah. nickel, or safety. So I thought that was interesting. He you said know. the same about Connolly, right? I'm not making Yeah, he may, okay. said the same about Connolly, but obviously that's a true freshman. Yes. Yeah. So don't expect him to play no, that much. No. We'll see. But Jalen Smith, obviously, coming off a really good Holiday Bowl performance, playing a safety spot after you know being a nickel all season. So... You know, we even talked about how Jalen could be a cornerback when he first came into USC. So I'm interested to see how they use him, especially with, you know, most people expecting Kamar Ramsey to play that nickel spot. So we'll yeah. see what they have a lot of versatility, which is something all the coaches talked about the need to want everyone to be versatile and have these kind of multi athletic backgrounds so they can do a bunch of different stuff with them. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, why don't we do this? Let's take a quick break and we will come back. If you have questions, you're watching live. Uh, thank you for doing that. If you're watching uh, on, uh, you know, watching later on the uh, replay, then uh, you, you won't be able to put your questions in. But if you're watching live on Facebook or YouTube, put your questions in there. We're going to answer some that are already in there and any more that come in, and then we'll get out of here. But back in a minute, everybody. All right, we're back here on Tunnel Vision. If you're watching uh, on YouTube or Facebook or on the uh, the Twitters or X, where they call it now, wasn't really much of a break, but this is for our podcast, so we take a break. Um, which I guess we normally don't do that on Tunnel Vision, so I guess I just did that, but that's okay. That's all right. Well, just it's a little, definitely crossover Tunnel Vision uh, Parastyle Podcast. Uh, the the line is blurred uh, between the two when we do these things live all the time. I forgot to mention. Uh, I wonder, there's some other, I guess not, you know, breaking news. Uh, eight Trojans are going to be in the NFL Combine. Uh, quarterback Caleb Williams, running back Marshawn Lloyd, wide receiver Brendan Rice, uh, wide receiver Taj Washington, offensive lineman Jarrett Kingston, defensive lineman Solomon Bird, safety Kalen Bullock, and uh, corner Christian Roland Wallace. So, any thoughts on that? Any snubs? What did, what did you guys think about the Combine, guys? Taj Washington always snubbed. Wait. No, he was oh, in there. Sorry. I totally blanked on that. I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> the only snub, Justin Dietrich, maybe? Yeah, but he, I don't think, with all due respect to him, played well enough to, to warrant an invite. He, he was the one guy who people on the peristyle were talking about getting snubbed. Uh, good for Jarrett Kingston for, for getting an invite. Yeah. He was on the bubble, I think, a little bit. And, I mean, I saw Casey Cosgrove, our friend, posted on the peristyle because I wrote up the story. Like, if USC does have seven draft picks – and they were seven and five. That, that just doesn't look good. Because I do think <laughs> out of everyone who was invited. Your I, first year covering the team, Car. This happens a lot. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, I feel like, I, I don't know about Kingston, but I think the rest of those guys have a great chance of getting drafted. And it all starts with Caleb, of course. I don't know. I I, I think a lot of those guys are really good players. And it just kind of goes back to how last season was a disaster because uh, I, they, they should have been better. Yeah. Blackie Chan mentioned Austin Jones. Yeah. Austin uh, probably – You kind of have to be the starting running back usually to be in the combine probably. It's tough. Running back's a tough position too. Like yeah. The way There's a lot of running backs. and Just get used because they're, you, can, you can kind of find a Austin Jones. With all due respect to him, you know, you, to, to get drafted, you have to be a special, special talent running back. Like Travis Dye, he was hurt, but he didn't even get drafted, I, I don't believe, right? And I feel like he was a little bit better than – that Austin Jones, they're guys you can undraft it and pick him up and throw him in. And it's just that position is tough. Yeah. And it might work and, you know, but probably not going to the combine. Also, there was a little bit of news, uh, signed a kicker or got a, a 2024 kicker. I'll put his picture up there. Uh, Ryan, what is it? Sari? Sari. Sari. Another you Ryan. To him. You Ryan. To him, Chris. I did. I did talk to him. A six-star six kicker, yeah. yes. And I know people thought maybe I was trolling a little bit, but no, that is the rating for him per the Chris Saylor rating system, which is like the premier specialist rating system. You know? Yeah. I can't believe USC didn't get any seven stars. <laughs> uh, give him a couple years. But, uh, you know, this is a All-American kicker, you know, out of uh, West Hills 
High School? West Chaminade. Hills High School? Chaminade. In West, West Hills Chaminade. area. There's not a West Hills High School? There's West Lake, but There's not West, West Hills. Uh, I'm getting schooled over here <laughs> by the, the SoCal guy. Uh, yes, uh, All-American kicker, good pickup. We'll compete right away with uh, incumbent starting kicker Dennis Lynch, a scholarship kicker. Uh, mm. He is a preferred walk-on. This will be a preferred walk-on spot for Ryan with an O. So he's looking to come in and compete. Strong leg. I believe his career long is 53 yards. And, yeah, it's a good, good deal when you can pick up a All-American caliber player and it doesn't cost you a scholarship. So he's going to come in there and try to compete and push Dennis Lynch, who you know needs to be pushed a little bit because it was an up-and-down season. I um, think he could win the job. Ryan yeah. Sayeri, I, I don't rule that out at all. all right, Never we'll with a kicker. Kickers can win uh, straight up out of camp as a freshman, so we'll see. Uh, let's get to the, some of the questions. We did have one email, Frank in Sacramento. It was following our interview with uh, Jen Cohen, so if you missed that one, we had that up on uh, our YouTube channel and on the podcast. Uh, Jennifer Cohen, the USC Athletic Director, came in the studio with us. It was awesome a couple weeks back. Frank said, just to pile on to uh, a late question for Jen Cohen that was asked, when will college football prioritize, prioritize the fan in the stands over TV deals? And you guys correctly said, never. I go to lots of college football games every season. I just consider myself part of an unpaid studio audience for a TV show that lasts four hours. Between the action, I wait patiently and watch the guy in the orange jacket holding the electronic signboard, counting down the minutes for each commercial, Frank in Sacramento. I, I that's still, the fan experience. That's the fan experience. Yeah. And they're trying, and that, I mean, it's hurt attendance all over the country, even in the SEC. Um, but TV, the money's so big, you have to kind of cater to television. So, I, yeah, I don't know what you can do about that. I went to the Rose Bowl in person for Michigan, Alabama. And do you guys remember if you were watching on TV, or I forget if you were there or not, but. The commercials in that first half were incessant, and it took forever, <laughs> but it was my first Rose Bowl game, and I was so happy to be there, and even though that was a big negative, I still think I go back in the future, and that's kind of what they're banking on. They know they have us, even with a lot of commercials. Rose Bowl's tough just being in the stands, because like, just to get out to go to the bathroom or oh, something. Oh, it's terrible. It, I missed like half the third quarter. Yeah, that's, that's the problem there. Like they, The Coliseum was bad. They, they made it better. They put more aisles in when they re- model and stuff. I don't think they fixed that as much in the Rose Bowl when they did some remodeling there. Let's go to some questions from the chat. Uh, TJ, am I crazy for still being skeptical? I was at Oklahoma when Riley had fired, had to fire Mike Stoops. Then he hired Grinch and it was even worse. Uh, then each year got progressively worse and he follows up. There's no precedent for him making smart defensive hires, which worries me. Grinch was better than, than Stoops. I don't think it got worse. It got a little bit better, not enough to really make a difference, but Grinch did come in and improve that defense. I think that kind of gets washed away a little bit because he was so bad at USC. But Later, no, I, yeah. I, I totally agree. you got to prove it on the field now, and if defensively it doesn't get better this year, then I, I don't really know what else they can do because <laughs> they've upgraded the players from when they first got here, the, the Riley staff. Now they've upgraded the coaching staff. I guess the last common denominator would be him. So I, yeah. it, it's got to get better this year. You're right to be skeptical. I, I do think it will get somewhat better. The question, of course, is how much, and that'll depend on a whole number of things. Uh, but, yeah, you're right to be skeptical. I think we all are. Yeah, I think you're absolutely not crazy for still being skeptical. That's fine. We, we, we all have a certain level of skepticism because we all say we have to see it on the field. Yeah. So once that happens, we can uh, reassess what's going on. You know, Grinch was successful at Washington State. Ohio, State's hi Ohio State hires him. So you're like, okay. I mean, it's not like North Texas hired him. And then Lincoln Riley hired him from there, you know, but it didn't work out. Denton Lynn only has one year of experience, but it was a very good year. So we'll see how that works out too. But yeah. All right. Kevin uh, on YouTube, do you expect freshman defensive linemen to play? Coach Henderson said that he wants everyone to play. Right now, I would expect Carlin Jones to maybe, I'm not going to say not redshirt, but play. I think uh, Giade Abbasiri is still too raw. I would, uh, I would bet on him being a redshirt 
And then I'm blanking on the third one, uh, Mana, who I'm not going to try to pronounce his full name. <laughs> That's a tough one. Look, uh, Ratu Mana. I would – he's going to be a summer enrollee, so I have to kind of – Carlin is going to be a summer enrollee as well, but I think he's bigger, and he has played higher-level competition out in Texas, and he's a consensus four-star recruit. I'm not going to count out Mana playing as a freshman – but the level of competition he played in California was very near the bottom. So I think that'll take some adjustment, especially for a lineman to jump to the college game. It's tough, offensive or defense. You're going against grown men as a, as a high schooler. So if I'm ranking them, it would be Carlin Jones, Mana, and then Giade, who is an early enrollee, but he's still so raw. But again, uh, we'll see. In the spring, that'll give us a better idea. And then in the summer, obviously, when they get on campus, Remember, Tuli Tua Pelotu arrived as a summer enrollee and ended up being a freshman All-American. So, again, Carlin Jones would be my pick to be a freshman to play. All right. Uh, we have a Facebook question from Danny. Uh, great to be on Facebook, too. Uh, was anyone worried that Lynn might head back to UCLA after Chip left? I was not. He said he was surprised. That uh, Chip left? That Chip left. I think the original question was about hearing his name thrown out there uh oh like I, he could have been a candidate yeah because i know there were some people like oh look for danton lynn i mean you could argue he was more qualified than deshaun foster right sure. like he's a coordinator um i just but, think with lynn he's doing usc this year for sure and then we'll see like if he was offered an nfl defensive coordinator job would he jump ship i can't say for sure he would or he wouldn't but just based on everything I know about him and, and talking with him, when you accept that job at USC, that's a premier school and having a chance to do something there is very significant. And I think he's the kind of guy who, even if a better opportunity did come along, I, I think he's locked in at USC this year and we'll, we'll see what happens a year from now. So to answer the emailer's question, was I nervous that he was going to jump ship? I didn't really think that was even going to be a possibility. Yeah. We well, get, was it Ryan Grubb? Like he's at a pretty good program, Alabama. <laughs> And uh, he jumped ship to go to the Seahawks. So, uh, you know, Bill O'Brien took a NFL head, co I mean, a college head coaching job at BC, was only at Ohio State briefly. But those were coordinators hired at Blue Bloods. Yeah, and those they guys left. are older, though, too. Yeah, that's true. And Lynn hasn't been established in college yet, like where those guys have done a lot more. If Lynn hadn't, I think the only job you could have been worried about him leaving right now would have been like the Baltimore Ravens. DC job, which was open for okay, like a yeah. week or so, and I think that would have been the only job to worry about. I don't, I don't think he was leaving for like a college head coaching job. The NFL at the Baltimore Ravens, you know, where he was, you know, groomed and you know came up with maybe that one, but yeah, I don't think he was leaving for UCLA. I don't think he wants to go back to the DMV. He doesn't really like it there. I mm. believe is what I was told. Mm. I'm just kidding. Technically, a little Baltimore shy. not part of the DMV. Little little. Is it not in Maryland? It's not. They consider their own thing. They don't consider – Baltimore does not consider themselves part of oh. the DMV uh, – what's the word? Area? No, the uh, acronym. Geography? Or acronym. Oh. Um, it oh. is part of Maryland, but they consider themselves different. They're, they're not they're, DMV. Yeah. Okay. I don't have time to get into the politics of uh, how the area views themselves. Sure. Maybe for when we do the preview for the Maryland game. All right, you're, I know you're, you've, probably like, you've probably pre-written a lot of that already. Uh, Black Matt Enns shouted out Maryland. He did. Nice. Well, uh, screw you, Ryan. <laughs> Blackie Chan, based off Chrissy T's list of who you would want to be yelled at the least, yeah. Ryan and Connor, who would that be? So Chris tweeted this out. I did a power ranking of the coaches. What was your the ranking? The new coaches that I, I would least want to be yelled at. So number one is like who I would not want to be yelled at on the sideline. Yeah. As a player, or I guess as me being a sideline person. Uh, my number one was Matt Entz. My number two was Coach Henny. My number three was Doug Belk. And then my last one was Danton Lynn. I don't think Lynn is capable of yelling. I don't know. I'm curious to see what that looks like. Uh, but that was my list, fellas. I only did the new coaches. I'd probably swap Belk and, and Lynn. And then on offense, I wouldn't want Josh Henson to yell at me. He'd probably be my, my top guy there. Right. Uh, Henson's up there. I think Henny would be too. Like Belk and Lynn just aren't. And we'll have to see them coach, and maybe that's right. going to change. 
Like this is more press conference. I was strictly feel. going on press conference vibes. Yeah, um, I think Ed's from the press conference would be mine as well. Um, this is a YouTube comment. Uh, Yosef, are they going to make changes on offense too? A finesse offense and a physical defense don't mix. Who says? It's Yosef says. <laughs> I think it could mix. I'm sure they'll make changes based on who they have, but all hey man, the coaches are back, and it's not going to change drastically. You'll you'll take the Holiday Bowl offense. You'll yeah. Take that. Uh, I don't know about the running game. The running game was terrible. Sure, yes, but again, it was like a. You'll take hot, the passing game. You'll take the sure. passing game. The running game absolutely needs to get better, but you know you were starting a true freshman out there and an amalgamation of a new line that protected well needs to get better in that aspect. But you would above all take what you were getting in that holiday bowl with hopefully an improved run game down the line. Yeah. I mean, you got to score points. I mean, Alabama switched offenses. They're trying to score a lot of points and do they, are they ignoring defense down there? It's, you know, Ohio state scored what 42 on Georgia or something in the national ch or the playoff game. Like I think when you have really good offenses, it can trump defenses a lot, but you're, it's like styles make fights. Like if you're going to play Iowa, it might be a lower scoring game because that's kind of what they focus on. But if you're going to score a lot of points, like you could have a great defense. They're still going to give up points because people are going for it on fourth down. You're trying to do more things. It's, it changes the, the way the game is played. So I think you can have a physical defense that's really good. If you pair it with a high-powered offense, that same defense is probably giving up more points just because you have a better offense with you. I, that's just kind of my philosophy on how that works. But Would Alex Grinch's USC defense last year versus Iowa's offense last year be the ultimate I mean, immovable force versus an uh, yes. unstoppable object? That Even need, more so than UCLA? That needed to happen for the Rose. I mean, for the uh, Holiday Bowl. Like, we wanted to see that. The world might explode. The NCAA football game maybe never comes out. Like, I, it just could have changed college football forever if that happened. USC would have beaten Iowa in the Holiday Bowl if they had played, I think. Because they scored points. Based yeah. on everything that happened and how much those guys bought in, I, I, that's what I think. But I, what I think if, the defense would have stopped Iowa's uh, terrible But offense. what if it wasn't the Holiday Bowl defense? Oh, if it was like the, what if it was like the last game of the regular season? Yeah. Then I might take Iowa. <laughs> yeah, that would be bad. Uh, Blackie Chan had a few questions. First, for Chrissy T., uh, when are you and Keeley playing rock, paper, scissors? Why were we? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Why? Yes. Why yes. We? I don't know if anyone saw that on the, the thing. You were playing. We, okay. She had pointed out several times that we were on the, the stream. Okay. So she said, I think it was Blackie Chan told me to wave to the thing. So I waved, <laughs> uh, to the thing. And then she turned to me. He's like, we should play, uh, rock, paper, scissors. And then we screwed up. Cause how do you play rock, paper, scissors? What do you go on? Okay, so Rock, we paper, do this a lot. Shoot. Yeah, we do a lot at volleyball. Yeah. We come to the okay. net. I go one, two, three, shoot, or one, two, shoot. So I just clarify. Before, I'll just okay. do whatever the other person does. We didn't clarify, and <laughs> I, I go on one, two, three, shoot. She went on one, two, bam. Yeah. So I'm a three and shoot guy. That's cool. I don't Are know you, how they do it in Boston. I think you got to, like, clarify. Are you a one, two? What did you say, Connor? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. So one, two, three, shoot. Yeah, that's what I normally do, but some people don't. Can so we do okay. a quick one? Sure. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh, both paper. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. At the I couldn't even that. tell what you were yeah, throwing. I, I, was he threw a you. rock, and I, I got I, stumped on the last one. Well, so I got I'm going to give it to him. No, you won. I, I didn't do. Our timing was off. Maybe that's why people do two. Uh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that was we had no compelling. we had no reason we other just than lost she just her. wanted to do it on a on a for the camera. Nice, but Black Chan had something to do with it. Like, uh, but we probably just lost some sponsors because of that. Uh, do you think Coach Henny could be recruiter of the year in a year or two? In a year or two, sure. Yeah, I could give him top ten recruiter recruiter of the year. We have to see. That's hard because you got to get a top five class. Like Fran Brown won it from 247 this year because Georgia had the number one class and he yeah, recruited yeah. a lot of good defensive backs. And I think the fact that Georgia had the number one class really helped him in addition to what he was able to do. So could he? I, I mean, maybe, but I, I just don't know if USC cumulatively is going to do well enough recruiting to have a staff member get it because you got to look at not just what they've done, but what the whole staff has done. And yeah. 
Oh, go ahead. I was saying if anyone on the staff is capable of doing it, it's him. Got signing you. multiple elite level defensive. I linemen. can see that, and and multiple like if USC signed five defensive linemen and two were like top quote like a five star and like a top fifty guy, yeah, you could you would be in the you you would get off get to the top five on points alone just with signing five dudes. Yeah. He also wants to know, based on the interviews, which position will be most improved, defensive line, defensive backs, or linebackers? Linebackers? I'm going linebackers. Just because they have the the lowest point, I would yeah, say. Yeah, they were like they've been unproductive for years. I I don't think it's the talent was bad, just their production was bad. Yeah. I think defensive backs. I know oh. Christian Roland Wallace was good and you got some good safety play, but I, I, I think you have a really good chance to be rock solid there and, and not allow as many explosive plays. I, I have high hopes for Doug Belk and Danton Lynn as a former secondary coach. I think that unit's going to be really good. But they're kind of trending up after the Holiday Bowl. They're like... I, I was looking more regular season, but you're right. The Holiday Bowl, they did play really well. Linebackers were still like meh in the in the Holiday Bowl. Yeah. So they're like they're like down here so they can just go... And, and I like think the this. fact that Entz identified it and was like, okay, they this ain't happening anymore. Like, the, instantly, you're like, okay, they're going to be better just from what they're doing. Um, okay, here we go. The last one. Oh, actually, I think we have two more. Two Facebook ones. Uh, first one, Juvenile? Uh, what do you think of all the Caleb hate from NFL scouts? Uh, I, I don't know if you're referring to that, like, super long uh, – Post that a former Jets scout made on Twitter that I had to like quote tweet it because it was so ridiculous. Merrill Hodge had some stuff to say about him too. I didn't see that. I saw something on the board, but I didn't actually see what he had said about it. It's that time of year. Like, yet he's been the consensus number one since last year. So you have to try to tear him down. That's just yeah. going to happen. Like, be I think contrarian this is, and yeah. be like, ah, no, I would go this way. So he's going to be number one. Yeah, Where I don't think there's any question. Pick. It's just who picks them. I think people had a problem with the crying and that he isn't known as making a great first impression sometimes. That's, that's what I've heard, and rightly or wrongly, that's being counted against him right now. I've done a bunch of interviews. Like, I did some Baltimore radio. I've done some Chicago radio. and I they were asking, Yeah, they're asking about, um, you know, Caleb and, and Baltimore, Cliff Kingsbury, too. Um, but, yeah, there was some talk of that. And, uh, yeah, it's just like, dude, like, he cried after he, he cares so much that it wasn't, you know, I don't look at that as a negative. I never looked at that as like a negative of what, um, you know, Caleb Williams personality. Like I would give him the story, like who was the most excited of anybody in San Diego that Miller Moss threw six touchdown passes. And it was probably Caleb Williams. Like Caleb Williams, <laughs> Miller Moss's mom, Miller Moss. That was the power. Miller ranking. Moss's girlfriend. Yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> That, I mean, when it's funny. When I went, uh, this was years ago, I won on The Price is Right. It was awesome. I had a great time. One of the best <laughs> days of my life. Drew Carey is there. And he's great. He's on camera and stuff. Why was he a great guy? Like, when we were off camera, he was like, hey, Ryan, you did so good and blah, blah, blah. And he was just where no one was watching. There wasn't, he wasn't making an impression. It just, he was gen like, that's just the way he was, genuinely nice. And you see... Caleb Williams wasn't playing. He's down there. He could have been like, oh, like I would have done better. Like, no, he really gave a shit that that Miller Moss had a great game. He it made him so happy that his friend and that someone that he was competing with was great. And I, I think that shows a lot about his character. So if people are questioning that because you painted your nails or whatever, like uh, I don't I don't think that's real. Who doesn't paint their nails these days? I was watching college basketball the other day. Every other player on one of the teams had their nails painted. So I don't think that counts against him as much. But you're right. It is that season of saying, here are all the problems with him. And maybe a team who wants him to fall to two leaks it out. I, I, I think the biggest problem you can have is if you're a Johnny Manziel and you just don't do anything and you party and you don't study. Yes. Like that is a massive, massive that problem. That is not Caleb. That you can't overcome. That is not Caleb Williams at all for his faults, whatever. I, I think with him, it, it's nothing even close to that. And I, I, I would certainly take him number one overall if I was a, a general manager because I don't really think his faults are that big. But if whatever, people might feel differently. Whatever, however you feel about it, 
you can overcome that, and it's not like he's not a hard worker. Johnny Manziel was like the 25th pick or something, but like Baker Mayfield, number one, right? Um, now he's still, his, you know, he had some bumps early, and he's, his career's still going. So I mean, it's, he, I thought he had a good year this year, but there was more well, questions. Jamarcus Russell, remember? Oh my God, they, that's they said, that's an absolute here, failure. Here, yeah, here yeah. watch tape, and then they had a way of knowing if he watched it, and then he said, "I did," and then he didn't. <laughs> it, it, guys like that who put in no effort and just. I don't even know if he was a partier, but you, you got to work hard, and that's that's the biggest thing. He obviously has a ton of natural talent, and that's the winning combination. The rest of the stuff doesn't matter a ton to me. I know they're paid a million dollars to look and poke holes and everything, but if you work hard and you're talented, you'll have a chance. And Lincoln Riley QBs have been successful in the NFL. So, yeah, you know, obviously very various levels, and some. I mean, if you're starting, around. it's like good. Like people yeah. are like bagging on Matt Barkley like the guy's made a living for uh, what like 13 15, I don't know how many years like more than 10 years in the NFL like that's yeah sure you're holding a clipboard a lot of times but he's played some that still takes a lot of work you're starting you know, there's only 32 teams like you've been starting for a while like that's that's pretty good you know one last one Desi on Facebook thanks for all the Facebook questions uh, is USC still looking for another quarterback no yeah, I wasn't sure because we the couple of months back we heard from Lincoln Riley, or maybe it was the signing period, December. He had said like we could bring in one or two, but then he brought he brought up you know uh, they're bringing in uh, Mayava from UNLV, but it made it sound like he wasn't going to bring anyone else in, right? Yeah, they seem pretty content with rolling with Miller Moss and Jaden Mayava and uh, Jake Jensen as their three. That's a Good, you know, not not a ton of experience, obviously, but Miller Moss being the older guy, Jaden, who has some starting experience where he was at UNLV and really talented, and then you know Jake Jensen as your deep reserve. I don't think they want to spend another precious scholarship spot. They only have, I believe, four right now, and there's other pressing needs like another offensive lineman, another running back, another big defensive lineman. And then, you know, you could go wide receiver. You could do some things with that. So I think I think just there are other positions that are more priority uh, above quarterback. They have three. I think you're you're fine. I think you're fine with three. I, I think quarterback's so important that I wish they had four. I, I don't know if I feel good if, with all due respect to Jake Jensen, if he gets called into action, he played the one play in the Holiday Bowl. And I still don't know if he got that first down on fourth and one. They said he did. But I'm still not sure about it. He hasn't thrown a pass. In History a, book shows it's a first in, down. In, in, a, in a competitive game, I, I would have liked a, a freshman who, if it's a lost season because you lose your first two quarterbacks, you can at least give some fans some hope and say, hey, here, here, here's this guy. Jensen was the fourth string last year and – well, I guess if Malachi wasn't always available, he, he was a third string in some games. But t to me, he's a fourth string quarterback, and he, he's someone behind the scenes who can help w with a younger player. I would have liked if they brought in a younger player, just because quarterback, if, if you don't have a person there, you're, you're in trouble. Hey, sure. but uh, on the other side, you don't know what you have in Jake Jensen. Maybe he's pretty good. You know, when he came in, you know, people were very high on him being, you know, an actual good quarterback and not just some, you know, throwaway. I'll trust Lincoln Riley, I guess. Who, who, who yeah, he knows, a, he knows QB. But, but I wish he had four. It's so, it's such well, an important spot. Well, you can't have four. Okay. You can't have four. had four last year. All right. Well, like head coaches don't leave for coordinator jobs at the same level in February, except it happens. Like <laughs> weird stuff can happen. The portal yep. opens up and there are names that you don't expect. And you're like, I, I mean, Yes, I don't think the plan is to bring in a quarterback, but if like some g amazing situation happens where you're getting this proven starter to come in, and I don't think Lincoln Riley is going to say no. Um, but that was already going to happen with Will Howard. And my mom scared him off. Right, but I mean, that's the, you know that that performance was months ago, so I think anything could happen. I don't expect them to be out shopping for a quarterback in April when the portal opens again. But weirder things yeah, have some, happened. Something could fall into their lap. Weirder things have happened. I hope it does. I'd rather spend it on a lineman. Two linemen, two tackles, two whatever. I'd rather spend it on beef than uh, an arm. Beef. I'm a beef boy. It's what's for dinner. I'm talking uh, about dinner. I'm going to have dinner tonight with that. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up. I think my voice is kind of gone a little bit too. We haven't done a a one sultry. of these for a while. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate everybody 
If you're watching us live on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, thank you so much. If you're watching the replays, that's amazing as well. Or listening uh, across the podcasting channels and whatever you get your podcast. All that's awesome. We really appreciate you listening to our little dog and pony show. Have a lot of fun with these. Um, spring ball starting March 19th. And the spring game is April 20th. They're going to go five straight weeks instead of having a week off for spring break. They're starting after spring break. So we'll have regular shows for sure during spring practices. Um, all the updates we're getting from that. We wanted to give you guys an update since we just got to hear from the coaches and uh, many of them for the first time and uh, kind of get you up to speed on what's going on. We will try to work on more off-season interviews, uh, more of the House of Victory interviews that we were doing before. Uh, maybe getting Miller Moss, some of those guys in there. It was great to get Jen Cohen in. We'll try to get some other um, players, coaches, administrators, and things like that during the offseason and kind of give you guys updates of what's going on. Uh, if you didn't see the Jen Cohen interview, go back and check it out. I thought she was awesome in here. It's great to great that she came into the studio. That was a lot of fun. So uh, any final words, Chris Connor? Fight on. <laughs> wow. I got nothing. Well, just can't beat that. Uh, oh, do we, we need a screenshot. What do, what do you want to do, Chris? You always come up with good ideas. Oh, rock, paper, scissors. Should we just pose it? <laughs> yeah, pose just, it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, I won. No, you won the last one. So I'll, I'll go. Nice. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up. Hope you guys enjoyed the show, and we will talk to you next time.